Good afternoon. So glad to be here with you today, and I've got a message that I promise you is going to stimulate your thought processes at least. I hope and pray that grace and peace will be with you all. You need that, grace and peace. And this message is going to be geared in that direction so that we can have grace and peace. So, oh, I guess I'm waiting on me. <laughs> uh, today as we gather, we're going to reflect on the profound themes in sin and suffering, remorse and regret. All of these things we have felt. The, you know, I can say that is a hundred percent because every man, every woman, every child has sinned against God. Sometimes we do it not thinking that we're going to have to deal with the outcome of what that sin was all about. That God is trying to deal with us in a way that will bring us closer to Him. He allows us to experience the sins of Adam so that we can't sit around in some piety and self-righteousness and say, well, that will never happen to me. Well, the moments you do, uh, you're bound for the, the promised land. I promise you, it's coming. But we're going to reflect upon the, these themes and, and uh, suffering and remorse and the, uh, the regret that comes because of our sin. Nobody feels good about sin once they realize they have done it. And I could ask the question, who among us has not sinned? And there would not be a hand raised. The reason for that, thank you, the reason for that is that everybody is a sinner. I'm going to show you the, the scriptures for this. It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to show you the Word of God so that we have those promises in front of us. However, people's faith, we in, in our faith, after our anguish and our despair, how many of you know what anguish and despair is? That is the fruit of violating God. You know how it feels to, to violate Him and then realize, I failed Him? How many people like failing? So, we want to turn to the Scriptures together and, and gain some insight and encouragement. And I always want to point out that Jesus allows these things to happen but then He offers us a free gift. But what He did for us when He died for us, that blood was spilt so we could be bought back from Satan, from sin, from guilt and, and remorse. That blood is the curative agent for all sin. But you know, it doesn't happen like we want it to happen. We want to be free of that guilt and remorse and, and the things that go along with that immediately. It doesn't come like that, does not He allows the suffering. He allows that guilt, that remorse. Why does our God allow these things? You know don't, you don't learn from anything that is fun. You learn from your sufferings. Everyone in this room has suffered at some point and in some way. But suffering has a lesson in it. The classroom experience for doing something that was out of line with our Creator. 
But we're going to talk about, the first thing we're going to talk about is the nature of sin. <clears throat> Y'all know about sin, right? We're masters at sin. Manipulation, dodging the truth, you know, telling, how many has ever told a lie? Have you ever told more than one lie? Okay. Well, I want you to understand what that means. Where was repentance? Because if you continue in a lie, then you didn't repent. You just said, I'm sorry, but it was the wrong kind of sorry. And we'll look at that together. The nature of sin, I've got a scripture for you. It is in Romans 3.23. This should be familiar to you. For all have sinned, how many? And fall short of the glory of God. At any time that you think you're, you've overcome something, look out. You need God to help you to overcome everything. And you can only overcome it through the blood of Christ. Sin is an inherent part of our human nature. It separates us from God. Because God has never sinned. He doesn't know sin. He has never experienced sin or the results of sin. But we have. And God has a heart toward us of love. You know, when you see somebody that if you fathered or been a mother of, of a child and that child does wrong, you should want them to repent, right? So what do you do? What, what do you do when your child fails and sins? Do you beat them? Sometimes you want to. But that doesn't teach them anything. See, correction is a part of that process at that point. You have to educate them on why they don't need to sin and what happens to their relationship with their Creator when they do. There, there is a wall between you and your Creator every time you sin. And it gets higher sometimes because there's no repentance of sin. But he's, he has a, a word for us. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What does that make you feel? Well, we've got something in common with everybody else, right? But that shouldn't make you feel wonderful because sin has consequences. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And anyway, it disrupts our relationships when you sin. And people know about it. Your relationship with those people, you know, you, you experience a God type. You're, you're kind of separated because you know that they have sinned. How many of you have ever judged somebody for their sin? Wow. That's 100%. And by the way, is that the response that we need when somebody has sinned? To tell them how bad they are? That's not correction and instruction and righteousness. That's humans trying to make them feel bad about what they did. Well, you know, God doesn't do that. That comes from your own heart. That struggle that goes on inside of you. And it comes from what you think about the people around you that is, has been damaged by that sin. If you ever told somebody a lie and, and then they found out about it, 
Did that affect your relationship with that person? Yes, it did. And for how long? Well, at that point, there's a choice of what we do with the, the sins we know about, right? Do we have the character of God and the nature of God inside of us? That's a question. And it's one difficult to answer because we don't know what God is like. Truly, the Holy Spirit is the only, uh, you know, spirit that can show us even the minutest uh, parts of what God is. He's too big to comprehend. He's too mighty for us to even fully understand. He's God. He's not a man. He created a body for Him to come here in and to pay for sins. And He did. Jesus loved the Father. And He loved us. But what we do to Him is damaging to that relationship, isn't it? Everyone has let Him down. Everyone is sin. That's what we read in Scripture. All have sinned. So, I want to talk to the religious just a moment. Don't get on the high house. You have sinned. And it will be exposed. And you will give an account for all of your sins. All of your sins. So, We've all fallen short of God's perfect standard. The acknowledgement of our sinful nature is the first step toward reconciliation and healing. If you don't acknowledge that you have sinned, what happens to your heart is, is that it gets hardened toward God. And the next time you sin, it's a little easier to do that, and, and then you get a little further away. And then, you know, even if you were a good, wonderful Christian, everybody that knows that you have sinned feels that distance that's in you. They can feel it because the relationship has been tarnished. Relationships. Husbands and wives that sin against each other. The relationship has been damaged. And it takes a supernatural event to make that reconciliation occur. Now, I'm, I'm speaking to your heart today. I'm not, I really am speaking to your heart. The Lord Jesus is coming back. And I promise you when He does, He's looking for those repentant that have washed their garments and the blood of Christ. And they have, from the heart, renounced that sin. If you don't renounce a sin, there's a spirit that continues to visit you. You have to, I belong to Jesus Christ. I'm a child of God. And the sin that I have sinned, I am sorry. Sorry to God that I did and the, and the relationship was damaged, but I renounced that spirit and that sin and you have to have godly sorrow. And then you have to st stand up to that spirit that brought that to you. Let me go on. I could really get on a hobby horse there. The consequence of sin. <clears throat> in the scripture it says, and in Romans 6, 23a, it says, for the wages of sin is death. And you know the rest of the scripture. But on purpose I wanted to leave that out. To realize that every time you sin, you sin against God. 
and the wage of sinning against God is what? Death. Uh, anybody in this room want to die? <laughs> but he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about a spiritual death. The life of God leaves you. And you're alone. Your whole being changes when God is not there. And by the way, your spirit is not controlled by God at that point because, you know, you've got to be dead to sin and alive to God. But you can't be alive to God and sin. Sin carries a severe consequence. Would you say? Death. Spiritual death. How long does spiritual death last? Eternity. So it separates us from God, disrupts our relationships, and tarnishes our soul. By the way, the, the soul, when it's damaged like that, you don't ever feel the same about yourself. But you won't tell anybody else. And the Bible says... Confess your sins to one another. Woo, if we did that. All right? If we did that, we would be... Thank you. But if we confessed our sins, then He could... What, what did the Bible say in James? He would heal us. Healing is not just physical. There has to be a spiritual healing for every sin you commit. And when you go to somebody and you confess your sin, now I'm not, I'm not talking about becoming Catholic. And I'm not, I don't have anything about, you know, to say bad about Catholics. They do what the Word of God says. They confess their sin and they receive a, a prayer and then they go and have to pray. They put themselves back in line. I'm not going to make you a Catholic today. But I want you to understand they're doing what the Bible commands. How many of you would like to confess your sins to one another as the Bible commanded you? Where do you get healing until you do what He said? I want to tell you that all sickness starts with something called disease, dis-ease. You can't be at ease with God or anybody else when you've got sin in you. And then your body begins to get sick because your mind and your heart is sick. Am I telling you the truth? But sin brings forth suffering internal and external how many of you've ever when you were a kid you know you did something bad and you knew, you knew it was bad and you just kind of hit yourself you're going to punish yourself because you did something wrong well I'm sorry that's not the way you get rid of the sin <laughs> you can hit yourself all day long and it won't make you righteous There's only one way for you to experience righteousness and it won't be yours. It's through the, this righteous one. Our God, and our Savior. But it brings suffering and something else that goes along with that. Pain. pain you hurt inside you're in solitude you know you've offended God you've actually offended yourself 
that pain is there. And then suffering and pain leads to spiritual death. Its effects ripple through our lives, impacting our relationships and our well-being and our sense of peace. We cannot escape the repercussions of our actions leading to remorse and regret. You see, there's every stage, there's something else we have to deal with. Remorse, I wish I had not done that. Regret, well, what are we regretting? We made a choice. We willingly sinned in the sight of God and the sight of men. It's, it's a bigger thing than most Christians want to even look at because it costs God everything to endure what He did for a people that did not care. A people that didn't realize that they had to have something to get rid of their, uh, their, their sins and to be healed of the sin. Healing of sin comes when you are honest to God about what has happened. Because you realize that you have to be honest to God. The Bible says suffering's a result of sin. In Galatians 6, 7, it says, Do not be deceived. Have you ever been deceived? Deception is a lie, isn't it? Every sin starts with a lie of some sort. Well, nobody found out. You don't understand. You are now set up for a hardened heart. God is not mocked. He cannot be. Man reaps what he sows. So every sin has fruit that comes from it, damaging. And all the people around you realize, because they are as experienced as you are, about their sin nature. Isn't that true? But because they all have sinned and come short of God's glorious ideals, that impact upon God. God cannot be mocked. When you've done something wrong as a child, of, you know, you do something wrong and your parent gets on to you, right? But the father, I want to tell you what happens. The father gets real quiet. Have you ever talk, uh, talked to him after a sin and you thought it would be a simple thing to get rid of it? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I need to go on. Our relationships are impacted, our well-being, our sense of peace. We cannot escape the repercussions of our actions leading to remorse and regret. The third thing we're going to talk about is suffering as a result of sin. The scripture that we're going to look at is Galatians. Again, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. If you did something, yeah, I remember uh, Brother Stanley saying, you're going to get back more than you sowed. A lot more. And often suffering is a direct consequence of our sin. Our choices have implications affecting not only ourselves, but all of those around us. Suffering can serve as a wake-up call prompting us to examine our lives, repent of our sins, seek uh, reconciliation with God and others. And others. It's an opportunity for growth and transformation. The child doesn't know what a sin is till he sins. And then he, if he had fun in sin, 
You ever had fun in sin? There was, in the scripture, it says that there was kind of joy in sin for a season. Then you find out that thing you did uh, will grow roots. It'll take up a part of your heart and your heart's never the same. The purity, the virtue is gone. And you've done something that you regret, right? Who's making you regret? You're coming to a knowledge that what you did has a price tag on it. And it costs you. It costs everyone, doesn't it? So, and everybody is aware that we're sinners. How many of you have ever tried to play the act that I've never sinned? Or I'm more righteous than somebody else? I've seen that a little bit in, in religious circles. Like everybody, you know, at none of this. Well, the Bible says they have. And the deception that I'm better than somebody else. How is a sinner better than anybody else? There's no difference between the little sinner and the big sinner. They're sinners. That was given to them. That name, sinner, was given to them by their Creator. They broke a law. They broke a law, and what happens when you break the law? You go to jail? Not in this case. <laughs> if, it's, if there's not repentance, it sounds like jail, just with an H. <laughs> Think about it. And all have sinned. All have sinned. There ought to be humility because we have done it. And we have offended the Father. And we have rejected the overtures that could transform us from being sinners to being saints. Well, I gotta go. I gotta go. Uh, the scripture for this is re for remorse and regret is 2 Corinthians 7.10 it says godly sorrow brings repentance so you have to have godly sorrow to change your mind about what happened so God allows things to make you get to that place suffering godly sorrow and it brings repentance a change of mind that leads to that leads to salvation. You have to realize where you were and why God allows suffering. And then godly sorrow brings repentance. And repentance leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Salvation has no regret. If everybody in this room could say, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. But by the grace of God, I have been saved. He changes us. He transforms us. And He doesn't leave regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. You know, I'm just sorry because I got caught. See, that's not from God. You got caught, and then somebody will do that fishing thing. Well, my sin's bigger than your sin. <laughs> you ever done that? Okay, well, I remember when I did something like that. Okay, well, we're not going to rehearse these things. We open wounds when we do that kind of thing. 
All right. But there's a path to redemption. The scripture for this is in 1 John 1 9 that if we confess, what does that mean? It's the same thing that he says about faith. You have to, as logo geo, you have to speak out, confess our sins, and he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from what? All unrighteousness. That's the healing. He brings back a pure heart to a person that was bloodstained, willingly evil. Now, I want to say something. You know, we live in a world that our gates are filled with information continually. We lust after things for what reason? We desire things that we don't have so we can raise up ourselves in front of others. That's pride. And what does that go before? God wants us to walk in this purity. He gives us a, a balm, to, to, a curative to, to keep us from doing that. He purifies us from all unrighteousness. But it takes Him. How many of you have ever tried to repent without Him? God, help me. Please have mercy upon me. Well, He's going to have mercy eventually. But He might let you go through some regret, remorse, suffering to bring you to this place. There's always a price for sin, isn't there? And you know better than anybody else about what, you, and what it costs you. But we don't compare sins with sin. Sin is a sin. That animal doesn't change from person to person. So let me go on. All right. Embracing God's forgiveness. You have to embrace this. You know, what does that mean? Hug the feet of. You know, it's Psalm 103, 12. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. How many of you know that Satan is... Uh, intent on making you remember your last failure. He doesn't want you to see yourself in the light that God wants you to see yourself in. Forgiven. Free. Unentangled. He wants you to still be entangled up here in your brain. You did this wrong. He wants you to be under condemnation even the ones uh, that we do and the self gets involved in that condemnation how many of you have ever whipped yourself over and over and over because of what you did isn't this a fun sermon <laughs> I've got I've got to go on I could I, on any point I could have stand here and just go on and on and on. But we recognize the weight of our sins, the remorse and the regret often follow, and it's essential to differentiate between worldly sorrow, which leads to despair and death, and godly sorrow, which leads to repentance and salvation. Godly sorrow brings about a change of heart and a turning away from sin and a pursuit of righteousness. The Bible tells you if you overcome a sin, then you ought to be the one preaching against that sin. You ought to be the one that's saying, uh, look, I want to I 
make a shortcut around that for you. I want to tell you that Jesus does not want you to do that because there's coming a lot of torturous things to your soul. Inside of you is the worst of the worst. You beat yourself up. You allow Satan to condemn you. Then you condemn yourself. And then you walk around others uh, condemned. There's no redemptive factor when you allow that to go on. So you have to get down on your knees before a holy God and say, I've sinned against heaven and you. Have mercy upon me. But not just have mercy upon me. By your Holy Spirit, give me the power to overcome sin because I can't, in my repentance, I need His power to never do it again. go on this was this one's hard isn't it learning from our mistakes there is a lesson in every sin that needs to be learned and heaven is waiting with bated breath for they look on you these cloud of witnesses are watching you sin and and you know the foolishness that blinds the mind that something good can come out of something bad. <laughs> the Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. What does that mean? Conceal. It is rebellion not to confess. And not only that, it keeps you from being healed. You say, well, I'll, I'll let the elders pray over me when I'm sick. Darling, you don't know how sick you are after you have rejected the overtures of the Holy Spirit and turned and done it despite what God... You don't even think about the end result. The only way that we can have a conscience is to know the Word of God. And a conscience doesn't work unless the Word of God is put in it. The corpus callosum where the soul is maintained and your conscience dwells has to have the Word of God in it to even know that you're doing things that are against God's wishes. But it will work once you put the Scriptures in it because all of a sudden you're confronted with the truth. God will remind you of His truth and He will show you that you need to have godly sorrow. Not worldly sorrow. I got caught. But godly sorrow. You were seen by the eyes of God when you did any sin. Isn't that true? Does God want you to sin? Of course not. And why in the world do we still fall for the lines of Satan that makes us think that everything that we see we've got to have or, and, and the lust factors go on and on and on. The gates are all open to the, uh, the voices of uh, Satan and his demons. And they make a good sales pitch. Don't they? Well, nobody will know. There's no bigger lie. Everybody will know. He will scream it from the housetops. You've read that, right? If you don't confess your sins, you conceal your sins, then He's going to make sure that everybody knows. 
by the way. And then pride gets involved because then you're embarrassed. Why are you embarrassed? Because everybody knows that I'm not perfect. <laughs> like they thought you were to begin with. You didn't even think that. <laughs> so, but wh whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. What does that mean? Their soul prosperity means that God wants you moving forward in Him. And blessings abound toward you when you are walking in concourse with God. Blessings. And you have a spirit that feels free because you're walking in the prosperity of the Spirit. And God's gifts are flowing through you at that point. God wants you to be free. That's the reason He sent Jesus. To make you free. Free from what? Basically, your foolishness. Your inability to know what sin does to a person. And what it's going to bring if it's not godly sorrow and repented of. Okay, let me go on. But the one who confesses and renounces, again, look at those words. Those are two different things. If I confess my sin, well, I'm free of it, right? No, not until you actually admit that that's a wrong thing to do and you renounce it and say, I'm not going to ever do that again. Now, if you played with rattlesnakes in my driveway, and it bit you. What's the chance that you would want to repeat that? It could have some real consequences. But if you went back and played with it again, something's wrong with your head, isn't it? And your heart too. <laughs> All right. But you find mercy when you renounce it. Mercy comes after you renounce, according to the Scripture. You can't just say, I'm sorry. You've got to say, Father, I renounce that. That was a wrong thing to do. I don't want to ever do that again. Please, Holy Spirit, give me self-control so that I don't do these things again. It's a surrendered life. Number eight, extending forgiveness to others. Okay, this is the big one. When will God not forgive you? The Bible says He doesn't forgive you when you're holding a grudge against somebody else. Scripture in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. For if you forgive others when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is a big one. People that come to me every day that can't forgive somebody for what they did. They don't understand. Your freedom is taken away the moment you say, I, I can't forgive them. That's just, that's too much. Wait a minute. Was your last sin too much for Jesus to forgive? And when somebody sins against you, you are required to forgive them like Christ forgives you. And He does not keep a record. I've heard that record business too that's been beaten in the ground. But if you have been forgiven, you know how much of a record is there? Zero. Zero. Embracing God's grace and restoration. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, it says, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others when they've sinned against you, their sins, 
your Father will not forgive your sins. This is a big thing. That's the only scripture that says God will not forgive you. Well, you don't know what... It doesn't matter. Your argument is in vain. There is nothing that God said there that you... Well, that's too big for you to forgive. Nothing. It's a big deal to our Heavenly Father that He had paid that price for your redemption, your freedom, and then somebody else sins and you can't forgive them. Well, you just don't know what kind of a person they are. Yes, I do. They're like you. They're human. It's a part of their nature. They were born that way. They didn't have to be trained to be sinners. They came here that way. You know, mine. Mine. Well, and then they get in the uh, even tiny babies, don't they? They fight with each other. Thank you. Admit that. You've been sinning a long time. You, you have a nature to sin. And it's going to take the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father to set us free. Adam's sin was a part of our existence. And they did not receive because they couldn't go back and, and Jesus wasn't there yet, see. They were caught in their sin and they were expelled from the Garden of Eden and they couldn't do the things that God had called them to. So now they were going to have to toil and women were going to hurt when babies came here. All the properties of our sin nature. Did that stop after Adam and Eve died? Of course not. Gardeners, weeds come up in your garden. Men, you still sweat. <laughs> the only thing a man can't do is have a baby unless they do something with their DNA and uh, you know, medical science, you know. Satan's too. <laughs> Men couldn't handle it. You don't know that. <laughs> you don't know that. Uh, anyway, let's go on. In our conclusion, as we reflect on sin, suffering, remorse, and regret, let us remember that our faith in Christ gives us hope and a way forward. It's the only way, isn't it? One way. Through Christ Jesus. One way that He can be our attorney, our advocate before the Father. Because the Father has one way that people that remain in their sin will not get to see Him. And the judge of the ages will be on the throne. And the sheep will be on the what? Right hand. And the goats on the left. I'm not saying anything political. <laughs> It's the way it is. There's a separation when you do things against God and His will. And through general, genuine repentance, confession, and embracing God's forgiveness, we can experience the transformative power of His love. Have you ever felt that? You know, it's like walking up to an enemy and, and saying, I forgive you. I love you. And then you put a warm embrace around them. 
That's what he did to the, in the scripture with the prodigal son. He threw himself on the prodigal before the, uh, the prodigal was fully home. He was embracing him. He put a new robe on him. A ring, a signet that he belonged there on his finger. And then he killed a fatted calf. And there has to be bloodshed somewhere. And they ate steak. <laughs> but he was at home. That doesn't mean that it was trouble free. You know, the brother was a bad Baptist. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Whatever you are. And immediately, he couldn't see his sins. And he was judging his brother. And immediately, his sins couldn't be forgiven. Because he did not forgive his brother. And the father says, all of this was yours this whole time. And here you are putting yourself in jeopardy, holding a grudge against your brother. You can lose it all because that's a sin too. Let us hold on to the promise of redemption knowing that in Christ we are made a new creation. And our past does not define us. How many of you have ever been defined because of your sin? You know, I could mention any amount of sin that has bound people. And then they get defined by it. The rest of their life they're called a prostitute, an alcoholic, a drug addict. But God says, I'm not going to now that you've repented and there's remorse and regret and all of that and it's all over. And when I've set you free. You're free indeed. May God's grace and mercy guide us on in our journey forward toward healing. You want to know why he's sick? Ever heard the word sin sick? That's where it starts. <clears throat> Letting down your guard. Doing something that the Word of God says you shouldn't do. And forgetting there's a consequence. And to be restored, it takes the blood of Christ. That's a big cost for somebody that doesn't even understand what they did to their Heavenly Father when they betrayed the Word of God. God is speaking to somebody today. And I want you to know, people make mistakes and they have, they have done failure, I mean had failures in their life because of their sin nature, but He changes the nature. Have you been changed? This isn't a little event. The Holy Spirit comes and makes you a new creature in Christ Jesus. Like Him. At that point, you hate all sin because you have experienced it. And then that, you, that hate, that's righteous indignation. And you should stand up against any sin at that point. It's not condemnation if you're seeing somebody you know, doing something that will send them to hell. Well, they think I'm preaching to them. Uh, I've been doing that for a long time. I've seen a lot of people change because of it. But it's not me that changes you. The Word reminds you there's one is the change agent. You can't change people. You can't control them into righteousness. 
you can't holler at them and make them feel better about themselves, you know, because they fit into your scheme of things. If you love people, you want to forgive them, but you don't want to leave them in sin thinking that that's okay. Repentance is necessary to escape the own, you know, slot of what hell is going to be like. The biggest part of hell that screams to me is I won't be with the Heavenly Father. The worm dieth not. Means uh, an eternity of having to be reminded and condemned an eternity apart from God. But it doesn't have to be that way. Those of you that are looking in and you sinned and you know you sinned, here it is. If you repent of your sins and ask Jesus, or renounce your sin, that it is wrong, you shouldn't have done it. You taking away the power of Satan. And then you turn to Jesus and say, Have mercy upon me. Forgive me of that sin. Empower me by the Holy Spirit to never do it again. You realize the negative things that happen every time. This is not once in a while. It's every time. God's calling His people home. And we've got to get ready. And getting ready means we're not looking for a place to do something that's against His will. You have to listen to the Holy Spirit. He'll say, that's not our way. He's aligning Himself with you to teach you things. And the Holy Spirit will come. How many of you have ever had the Holy Spirit talk to you about your ways? Hopefully everyone. But the Holy Spirit is a Holy Spirit. And He comes to make you holy. Amen? Yeah. All right. I love you all. hope you heard and I hope the Holy Spirit speaks to you that the next time you're being tempted, you will resist the temptation and you'll renounce that because you know that it's sin because you've done it before, right? How did you feel about it? You want to feel that again? There's a reason that sin hurts. Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that this message has hit the hearts of people around the world and those that are here, that they will be more cautious of the lies of Satan that says, oh, you need that or you need to do these things and knowing that they shouldn't. Father, I ask you to put the spirit of knowing in them in the, in the greatest way they've ever experienced so that they will not be led down the road of sin, guilt, remorse, suffering. Father, help us all. Empower us by your spirit. Give us your mind, Jesus. Help us to resist all temptation. For your name's sake and your glory, forever and ever, amen.